Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I'm a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. Our call to worship. The dust that shapes the journey, the cross that guides it, the color that surrounds it, the light that fades through it, the word that foretells it, the wilderness that invites it. This is Lent and into the wilderness God calls us. Come everyone, Christ is heading for Jerusalem. We open in prayer. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of your complacency and routines. Set us free from our self-imposed bonds and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray, amen. What is Lent? Lent was established initially for new Christians, those who experienced a call. They were to spend 40 days and 40 nights preparing for their baptism. If in the end they still wanted to follow Jesus, then on Easter Eve they would be baptized as the sun was rising in the east, signaling the new day, the new era, inaugurated because of the resurrection. The powerful significance for them was to prepare for their vocation as Christians the same way Jesus prepared for his vocation as the Messiah, 40 days of introspection and self-examination. Later, the church used the 40 days of Lent as a time of renewal for those who were already Christians because at a certain point it seemed that everyone was baptized as infants. So the time of Lent was used as a time of renewal and recommitment to the Christian life, examining our lives in the light of the one we are supposed to follow, according to Mark Trotter. So what is Lent today? Today, Lent is observed during the 40-day period between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. It is a time to set aside our wants and needs, to come humbly and meekly before God, recognizing our need for a Savior above all. Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, reminds us that we are from dust and return to dust. Ash Wednesday serves as a reminder that we will die and face the consequences of sin. The meaning and purpose of Lent are to reflect on our sinful nature and praise God for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christ came to serve, live, and die for our sins. Lent ends on that glorious day of Easter when we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, we're no longer cursed to the grave, but our sins are forgiven. Lent continues into the Holy Week with Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday events. Monday, Thursday commemorates the day Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples, washed their feet, and retreated to the Garden of Gethsemane for prayer. During the Passover meal, Jesus institutes the act of communion and remembering his sacrifice. Good Friday is the day Jesus was crucified. It is called good because of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. Without this good day, we would not have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life in heaven. During the season of Lent, we rightly focus on repentance and the call for us to confess our sins. It is a season of prayer and fasting, a season where we can assess our lives of faith and discipleship, determine where we are lacking in areas where we need to grow. On Ash Wednesday, we are encouraged to observe a Holy Lent by self-examination, penitence, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and meditating on the Word of God. Repentance often gives a negative reputation in our world today, and the reality is the church is partly at fault. The loudest examples of calls to repentance are often the preachers that preach fire and brimstone, turn or burn. All too often, the loudest voices and the caricatures of repentance are those which emphasize fear of eternal damnation. I think we've all seen or heard the person on the sidewalk calling for those passing by to repent of their sins if they don't want to experience external, eternal damnation. At the root of these calls to repentance is fear. The message is clearly designed to convey a sense of urgency. Repent if you don't want to experience the eternal torment. Repent if you don't want to feel the searing flames of hell. 
Repent if you don't want to experience life in the darkness for eternity. There is an urgency about the unrepentant sinner's state, but also an urgency on the timing of God's ultimate return. The warning is always imminent. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, Jesus seems to uncharacteristically, at least for how we want to think of him, use this sort of tactic as well. He rebukes the self-righteousness of the crowd who think they are better than the people who died at Pilate's hands, telling them, unless you repent, you will perish as they did. There is an immediate urgency. Repent so that you might not experience the same fate as them. A little harsh, but perhaps what Jesus' hearers who were so wrapped up in their own self-righteousness needed to hear to snap them to attention and into the lives that Jesus was calling them to. Fortunately for us, this isn't the only or even the most pervasive in understanding of repentance in our scriptures. Vincent Donovan, the great Catholic missionary to the Maasai people of Tanzania, suggests that if you study the apostolic approach to sharing the gospel very closely, you will see that something is missing. Sin is missing. There is no mention of original sin or any kind of sin. Sin will come later, after Christ, after getting to know Christ, in relation to Christ. But sin, portrayed by the first preachers of the Christian gospel, is forgiven sin, something entirely different. After all, isn't it that the only kind of sin there is in the world is forgiven sin? The job of a missionary, after all, is not to teach sin, but rather the forgiveness of sin. Repentance comes after grace. Repentance comes after we have come to know we are forgiven, after we have received the mercy and love of God, not before. It is only when God's grace is extended to us that we can even acknowledge our sin, our sin which has been forgiven by God in the person and work of Jesus. This is the dominant type of repentance we see throughout our scriptures. Repent and live, rather than repent or die. This is the second kind of repentance that we get a glimpse of in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. The prophecy in this passage from Isaiah was directed to the people of Israel who had been in exile for almost 70 years. They had experienced the consequences of their sin and disobedience. They had experienced the judgment of God. And so these words would have seemed a dream. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for what that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. The primary word in Isaiah's call to repentance is come, which he repeats five times. He doesn't call Israel to turn away, to reverse course. Rather, God, in the prophet's words, is inviting the people, inviting them into a life that is completely different than one they know. The images that Isaiah uses to point to God are of our own basic needs, food and water. Isaiah tells us that God is like our most basic human need. He is our water. He is our bread. Jesus also tells us that he is the living water and the bread of heaven. But God isn't just enough to subsist on. He doesn't extend a life of just enough. He is described by Isaiah as the most luscious banquet of milk and wine, not just water, of rich food, not merely the bread we need to survive. And where could we get food and water at no cost? Certainly not in the world we know and live in. Where else could we get the richest milk, the richest wine, and the richest food for no money? Only in God's kingdom. God's invitation to repent comes with the promise of abundant life. It comes with the promise of faith which is full of God's love and mercy, full of his grace and full of his very life. Repent and live. 
Even here, though there is an urgency, an urgency not based on fear of punishment, but an urgency so that we don't miss out on the abundant and eternal life that God has prepared for us in Jesus. Theologian Stan Mast writes, a Godward focus doesn't make this call to repentance any less urgent or serious. It is still a life and death matter. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it underlines the importance of this turn with these mysterious words, while he may be found and while he is near. Does that imply that there may be a time coming soon when the Lord will not be available, when he withdraws his offer of grace, when it is too late to repent? There is no easy answer to that question, but the reality is it shouldn't matter. Repentance is a life and death matter now. Whether it is Jesus' shocking rebuke to repent or die, or Isaiah's more soothing call to repent and live, we are faced with the choice to orient our lives to God now or not. Repentance means turning our thinking, our actions, our whole selves towards God and towards the life he has promised us and won for us in Jesus. By his incarnation, by his death, and by his resurrection. If we choose not to repent, then we live a life in the here and now, marked by the death and decay of sin. We live a life marked by the brokenness and darkness of the world. Because we choose not to accept the forgiveness of God, we choose to go our own way because we know better. But if we choose to repent, then we live life in the here and now. That is shaped by the very life of God. If we repent, then we have life marked by healing and liberating power of the Holy Spirit. If we repent, we have a life filled with the love and grace of God now and forever because we choose to live into the forgiveness of God. We choose God's way over our own way. There are times in our life where we need to hear God's sharp rebuke of our sinfulness those times where we believe we are more righteous than everyone else, those times when we condemn others and judge them less worthy of God's love and grace. That's when you and I need to hear Jesus say to us, unless you repent, you will perish. But there are also times in our lives when we have been broken and worn down by the consequences of our sin and the sin of the world that we need to hear God's invitation to come to him and leave our sinfulness behind. Those times when our mistakes have destroyed our self-esteem, those times when our unloving has hurt the people closest to us and left us all alone. That's when you and I need to hear God say to us, repent and live. Come and eat the bread of forgiveness. Come and drink the wine of new life. This Lent, let us reclaim repentance for what it is, God's call for us to turn back to him, to turn back to the life that he has prepared for us, to embrace the forgiveness, mercy, and grace of God wherever we find ourselves. It is, after all, a matter of life and death. And let us choose life. And let us now, God's people, pray. Creator, Lord, you have given us eyes to see ourselves as we truly are in the heart to accept your free gift of grace through Christ. Fill us now with the courage to step forward in faith, to repent of our sins, and to turn the life we have been given to your guidance and to your service. O God of mercy, we now confess and begin again. Most holy God, you sent Jesus into a world of temptation and trials, not so different from our world of today. Accepting obedience to your law, he triumphed over it all to save us. Shield us from the lures of false prophets as we begin our own 40 days of reflection to keep our hearts true and trusting in your eternal grace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our great high priest, and the Holy Spirit, our sanctifier, who reign with you as one God forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hello. It's a pleasure and it's a privilege for me to be joining with you on this Sunday service. And my name is Pastor Teach uh, from Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle. And I'm going to be sharing with you the word of God today. 
let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share the word of God during this Lent season. Even as we look forward to Easter, we pray that this word will make us wise and grounded in the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be sharing on a subject I've entitled The Whole Duty of Man from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 13 to 14, as well as Proverbs 1, verse 7. But before we read, let me just begin by giving a little bit of background of why I've chosen this particular text. Now, it's been a couple of years, maybe after the COVID-19 has been, you know, officially ended, but we can all agree that that season was a very difficult and painful season for everybody. Nothing like this had ever happened to us, at least in our living memory. It was a time of confusion, uncertainty and frustration. Yet for me as a minister of the gospel, it was a time of reflection and soul searching, especially pertaining the state of the church. And there are things that we have taken for granted in this life that COVID-19 helped us to kind of treasure once again, family, friendship, fellowship, even freedom of movement. The lockdowns were not so comfortable and not just inconveniences, but became real restrictions for most people across the globe. Yet that experience was the birth of this message that I'm sharing with you today. We're going to share very briefly what we believe is the most important purpose of life. Let me read verses 13 and 14 of the book of Ecclesiastes. Verse 13, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment along with every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word today. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes gives us an analysis of life from various angles and the book is not so easy to understand as it sometimes the things that it says can be considered pessimistic or even contradictory i mean consider for example ecclesiastes 7 verse 17 verse 7 verse 15 it says in my futile life already it gives us talks about the futility of life it says i have seen both of these a righteous man perishing in his righteousness and a wicked man living long in his wickedness and says, don't be overly righteous and don't make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? And don't be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? I mean, it's so difficult to engage with such a scripture that seems to say to us who are pushing for righteousness. Even during this Lent period, some of us are fasting and, and cutting down on certain pleasures as we anticipate the passion of Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 16. The preacher says, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise, just as with a fool, seeing that both will be forgotten in the days to come. Alas, the wise men would die just like the fool. It's almost contradictory to what Proverbs says, to say, blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who acquires understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, and her gain is better than fine gold. So why should I be wise if, if there is no lasting remembrance of the wise? Yet I love the conclusion that we read this morning. Yet it concludes by telling us what the whole duty of man is. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Because God will bring all things to judgment. Let us try to explain what that really entails. What is fearing God? How do we keep his commandments? And what about the judgment? What is it about? So briefly, let's just dive into this. 
Let's begin with the fear of the Lord. Ecclesiastes actually ends where Proverbs begins. And Proverbs begins by encouraging us to fear God. That's why we have read Proverbs 1.7, which is more like the key verse of the entire book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Brothers and sisters, to fear God means to reverence, to respect and to honor him. The fear of the Lord is that attitude of reverence and all that God's people show him because they love him, because they honor him. And an unholy fear makes people run away from God. When you are afraid of judgment, you, run, you tend to run away from God or hide. But a holy fear brings confidence, but at the same time brings us humility. And we humbly come before God in loving submission to him. So when we talk about fearing God in the book of Proverbs, we're basically saying that to be wise is to fear God. It, it provides, you see, godly wisdom provides insight into uh, a, a life or, or how we can respond to God in holiness and in righteousness. A wise person will apply guidelines revealed by God to his or her daily activities. Wisdom, therefore, is faith in action. I always wonder when I look at medical doctors, I love medical doctors, but I find them teaching people about lung cancer at the same time they've got their most expensive cigars. Is there wisdom in that? I'm just, just, just reflect on some of these things. See, when we talk of the fear of God, we, 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 we actually when we read, especially the book of Proverbs, is saying the fear of God is the principal thing. If wisdom is the principal thing and the fear of God is the starting point of knowledge and is wisdom, then the fear of God is really the principal thing. So true knowledge is founded upon a healthy relationship with God. True spiritual knowledge does not come from much study. It comes from our relationship with God. So let us do all that we do, but let's keep the principal thing in mind. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We cannot build without the foundation. When we go to Matthew chapter 7, 24 to 29, Jesus tells the parable of the wise uh, builder and the foolish builder. These two builders, one uh, builds on sand, one builds on a rock. And when the vicissitudes of life come, when the challenges of life came, when the storms came, the house that was built on a sure foundation, which is the rock Jesus Christ, it stood. But the house that was on sand was washed away. See, our biggest challenge today is that there is no fear of God. And therefore, we, when, 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 when circumstances come, when storms of life come, we are quickly swept away because there's no fear of God. In Psalm 12, verse 1 to 2, David laments the lack of the fear of God. He says, help, O Lord, for the, uh, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. They lie to one another. They speak with flattering lips and a double heart. Brothers and sisters, let us return to the fear of God. Let us return to that place where we fear God. Psalm 33 verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah. Proverbs 14 verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. True fear of God results in living for God rather than for self. Many of us in our contemporary society, we live for ourselves. We live a life that is not given to God. We live a life for pleasures for ourselves alone, our own comforts. Yet, we are learning here. At the end of it all, fear God. Number two, follow His commandments. The fear of God results, brothers and sisters, in obedience to God. True fear of God is demonstrated by our obedience to Him. How much we obey God shows how much we love Him. How much we obey God checks our motives and our behaviors. That is the true fear of God. 
where we have read, to obey is the whole duty of man. To fear God is the whole duty of man. There is no higher calling for man than to bring glory to God. There is no higher purpose of man than to bring praise to God. God commands us to love one another. Let us do just that. God commands us not to have other gods. Let us do just that. God commands us to seek the best of others ahead of our own. Let us do that. That is obedience. That is obedience. You see, man's duty is to love God and love his neighbor. Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says to love God with all our hearts, our souls, and our strength. That's what we must do. And in Matthew chapter 22, uh, one of the scribes comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what is the greatest law? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. That is the greatest commandment. But he also said there is another one which is like unto this one. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, we love God. We love our neighbors. Why should we do that? If we do not fear God, if we do not follow his commands, we are in peril of judgment. Let us know that every act under the sun will be brought under God's judgment. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Speaking to the Athenians, the Apostle Paul put it this way, for he, that is God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the men he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Brothers and sisters, if we do not fear God, if we do not obey his commandments, we are in real danger of God's judgment. Let me conclude by quoting Acts chapter 13 verse 36. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. What are we saying? Live a meaningful life by serving your generation. How do you save your generation? Number one, share the gospel with your generation. Matthew 28 verse 19, Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Number two, serve your generation through love. Mark 12, 31, love your neighbor as yourself. Number three, save your generation by leaving a legacy. What will people remember you for if they remember Dorcas or Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 from verse 36? She was remembered for her craft through which she ministered to others. What will you be remembered for? So by doing all this, you demonstrate your love and devotion for God. You demonstrate your obedience to God. Indeed, when the day comes and you are face to face with your maker, you will be ready to present yourself before him for you would have done your whole duty. Fear God, obey God, and you are out of danger of judgment. Thank you, Lord, for this ministry today. Let it speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen.